Uh, just a month ago at the Rugby Prophecy Day, we looked at the background through the peace accords, which has been a very exciting happening for brothers and sisters throughout the country and throughout the world, as we saw prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes. We knew that somehow the countries of Sheba and Dedan, the Arab countries, had to be friendly with Israel before the Gogian invasion. And what seemed impossible just a few years ago was now becoming a reality. And so what we want to do is to take that a little bit further and want to just have a look at various aspects. If you didn't hear the talk of the Prophecy Day, then on the screen is the link that takes you to the talks, the four talks which were given at the Rugby Prophecy Day. And I do recommend that you go and listen to those talks. It was a very thrilling uh, day and gives us a lot of background to what we're going to talk about today. And also, if you haven't had the milestones, again, this contains a lot of scriptural references and evidence that the hand of God is working among the nations and leading to the coming of the Lord Jesus very soon. So again, if you want to look at that, if you go to the website www.milestonesuk.org, you can read the first few pages, you can see all the different editions as a bear. But what we want to look at are the fruits of peace in the Middle East. The great changes which the Abraham Accords have brought about. And it's so exciting to, as uh, Brother Mike was saying, to see prophecy being fulfilled in our lifetime. And these things tell us that the word of God is true. And what's been so interesting is to see how God has used COVID very much as his means of changing the world situation so it aligns with what he wants. Britain is being pushed away from Europe. America and Europe are parting and Britain and her allies are joining together with the Arab nations in a most wonderful way. And what we have to realise, and what the nations don't realise, is that the word of God says that everything happens because it is God's will. World events are under the control of God. And he has an end plan which will see the world divided into two camps. And they revolve around just one nation. Those for Israel and those against Israel. And through his prophets, he has revealed who's going to be in which camp. And so man might have his plans and purposes, but if they're not in accord with God's plans, then God has to use, through the angels, events to cause people to move in a different direction. And that's what we've been seeing. But everything revolves around God's purpose with his people. Now, if we take the area of that rectangle as representing the land area of the whole world, then that little dot in the middle represents the area of Israel, a most insignificant little area in the world that we live in. And yet God has chosen to center his plan and purpose around this little tiny nation and he's placed Israel at the most strategic point there is on the world. It's where Eurasia and Africa meet together. That's where he has placed Israel. And we can see just how accessible it is. Um, by sea from uh, America, by sea from Australia, by land from Asia and Europe and Africa. Uh, and this is all in preparation for the coming kingdom 
and all nations will come up to Jerusalem. Now, God has told us those nations who are going to be for Israel and those who are against. And that's what we're seeing happening in the affairs of men. That nations such as these in the south of Israel are now turning to be friends with Israel, together with Morocco and Algeria. Uh, India is very friendly with Israel and little Bhutan that's just signed an agreement to the end of the year. Britain, of course, and off this map, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, these are all friendly with Israel. But the nations that are against us, as Ezekiel 38 lists, tells us that countries like Iran and Turkey are very much against Israel. And uh, the whole of Europe and Russia will unite together to come against Israel, to drive Israel from their land and from their city. And also we're told that Libya is part of that assembly of nations that come against Israel. And so this is what we're seeing happening before our eyes, the, the shaping of the nations in order that these two camps might emerge. And sadly, uh, Europe is going to be in the camp against Israel. And that's why it's so necessary that Britain separates from Europe. And so we want to concentrate on Israel's friends and to see the role for Britain now free of the EU. Just now setting upon an independent pathway. And it's not been a smooth journey, has it? And Brother Mike has taken us to this reference in Ezekiel chapter 38, which tells us about uh, those nations who are on Israel's side when Israel is invaded. Sheba and Dedan, which links us to the Saudi Arabian Peninsula uh, and the Arab nations there. The merchants of Tarshish, uh, Tarshish originally was in Tyre, was the major maritime power in the time of Ezekiel, um, but now has come to Britain, and Britain now plays the role of the latter-day Tyre Tarshish power. And she has with her many young lions, uh, and these are the ones referred to in Ezekiel chapter 38. And so in a wonderful way, we are seeing that Britain is being prepared for the role that God has appointed for her. She is separating from the rest of Europe because Europe is going to be opposed to Israel's uh, existence, whereas Britain is on Israel's side. And so we have seen through the situation with COVID and the vaccination row with the EU, just how much Britain is being pushed away from the EU. And this was an interesting article on the Thursday in the Times. The EU risk aversion is costing thousands of lives. And I'll, I'll just enlarge that uh, paragraph there. The hesitancy and mismanagement we have witnessed in recent weeks could cause serious long-term implications for Britain's relationship with Europe after Brexit. And it went on to say that Boris Johnson uh, was open on a pragmatic basis to greater alignment with EU rules, to ease trade and to minimise the greater than expected cost of Brexit for British food and retail industry. So he was inclined to go along with the EU, but no longer. After the vaccine debacle, that has changed. And the Prime Minister now wants to avoid Europe's attitude to risk. And the article said, why, given the events of the last two months, would Britain want to align herself with the EU's political culture of risk aversion? And so we see wonderfully how through COVID and through all the shenanigans over the vaccine, it has caused 
uh, Johnson to change his mind uh, and increasingly see that Britain's pathway is not with Europe, but is with the rest of the world and with the Commonwealth especially. Now, there was a frightening statistic within that article in the Times. It was this. If you vaccinate 100,000 people aged over 50 today, rather than tomorrow, you will have 15 fewer deaths. Now, in the EU, there are approximately 150 million people aged 50 plus. And so, if one was to vaccinate um, today instead of tomorrow, that will represent a saving of 22,000 deaths. But we're not talking about one day. On March the 20th, the UK have vaccinated 50% of all adults, whereas the EU only 12%. It's going to take months for Europe to catch up. So if it took two months, a delay of 60 days for 150 million people aged over 50 will result in 1.3 million deaths, which could have been avoided. That's a frightening statistic. And in the Telegraph today, the editorial comment was the EU has been exposed as a sham. And um, the last part of the first paragraph there, this COVID um, of Britain's rollout of COVID was the first great test of what Brexit Britain could achieve. And it has been a triumph. Yes, there have been many. Uh, upsets, but as far as the vaccination is concerned, it has gone exceedingly well. And so we look at Europe and we just see the shambolic situation there. The EU has been acting in a bizarre, irrational way. Uh, and we have to say it's just not only in the vaccines, but uh, the fishing uh, of Northern Ireland and exports to the EU and financial services. At every turn, the EU has tried to make life as difficult as possible for Britain. The EU is intent on punishing Britain for leaving the EU. Well, it was all that many, wasn't it? It's gone. Yes. Could you just mute, please, dear? Sister Eunice, can you just mute your microphone? Um, so one can see this growing rift. And again, just the last Sunday, the headline in the Sunday Telegraph was, if the EU continues to act like a hostile state, the UK should treat it as one. The EU's behaviour over the past year must prompt a reappraisal of our geopolitical goals. For most of the past four centuries, we have been a blue water nation, chiefly interested in transcontinental commerce, open sea lanes, and links to distant trading posts and the Times colonies. We have thus both pushed and pulled to get towards a closer relationship with the Commonwealth and Anglosphere countries. While individual European states might still be considered allies, the EU as a whole has chosen instead to be a rival. Uh, and it, it's had this remarkable comment. We need to face the fact that the EU is now closer to, say, Russia than it is to Canada. Brussels does not regard us as a neighbour whose economic success will enrich its own peoples, but as a renegade province whose wings need clipping. Our response must be to soar higher. And so, step by step, we can see how God has been using uh, the various uh, scenarios of COVID to push Britain away from Europe. And here's another headline. The UK and the EU beginning to diverge 
on financial regulation after Brexit. That was yesterday's paper. Uh, and the prospects for supervisory equivalence fade as each side pursues different rules. Because Britain has been shut out of the financial market, she's had to respond with uh, opening up other markets, which has caused her to diverge from the EU. And here's another threat that faces both Britain and the EU, that the future of the trade balance, says David Frost, hangs in balance. Now, we remember that uh, it was at the last moment that Britain and the EU hammered out a, a trade agreement. And here we see the two parties signing them. Um, they were just merely signing a little bit of paper. The Trade and Cooperation Agreement is a huge tome of 1,246 pages. And we know how Britain, uh, the Houses of Parliament, the Houses of Lord, and the Queen signed off this agreement. But the EU has not yet signed off the agreement. Because it had to be translated in 20 countries. I would like you to unmute. So I clicked on unmute. Can you please unmute? That's right. Um, it has to be translated into the 23 official languages, and that was known it was going to take a time to do that. So they were given a deadline of the end of February to approve. But that deadline passed, and the new deadline was set, which was last Thursday when the EU were having their summit meeting. But the EU themselves postponed the signing or an approval of the treaty because they were upset that Boris Johnson wasn't going to immediately implement the Northern Ireland Agreement. It needed more time and more effort to get that going. And so at the moment, no date has been set for the EU to sign up and approve the deal. And with the present problems that Britain and the EU have, it's not difficult to see that there isn't going to be agreement because all 27 members have to agree and sign up to the deal. If just one of them says no, then the whole thing falls apart and Britain and Europe sign, uh, uh, have to trade on World Trade Organization terms. So we may very well find that the things are going to get far worse between Britain and the EU. But as well as causing a rift between Britain and the EU, there has to be a rift between America and the EU, because America is on the side of Britain, on the side of Israel, not going to be on Europe's side. And that rift started back, this is uh, from 2018, under Trump. This was the front cover of The Economist. Trump was about to come to Europe to address NATO and to berate them that they are not putting enough money into NATO. And this very cleverly uh, shows, if you look at the profile, it is a Trump's face, there is this separation. Well, that has continued. It looks as if it's going to grow under Biden. Germany is pouring cold water on the Biden Europe love fest. And uh, again, it says, even the arrival of a pro-European uh, US administration can't paper over the unmistakable signs of transatlantic trouble. Uh, and here's uh, another one from Thursday. Um, because of the irrational behavior of the uh, EU towards uh, the vaccine manufacturers, this is an American manufacturer whose product uh, is just about to be released. It's been approved. Who, let me just uh, put up a bit more detail. Uh, they have delayed signing a deal to supply the European Union with doses of their life-saving vaccine 
Britain because uh, of all the problems that the EU are causing. Now, Britain signed up last year, seven months ago, and has the promise of 60 million doses, which should shortly be coming to this country. But as far as the EU is concerned, uh, this company is not, doesn't want the hassle of dealing with the EU. And we can see, you know, all these little steps are causing this separation. And a uh, headline back in February that uh, Biden's growing frustration with Europe and their links with the Chinese um, has uh, made him quite hostile to uh, the EU and much more friendly to uh, Britain. And one of the great things which uh, both Trump and Biden are very much against Europe is this uh, pipeline taking gas from Russia to Europe. Uh, and again, this is just in yesterday's paper. Um, this uh, pipeline, the original pipeline ran from Vigborg to Germany. It's a twin pipeline that was opened in 2011-2012. And last year, they began the second twin line from a, a different starting point, but going to the same place in Germany. And that was almost completed when Trump put sanctions to stop this pipeline from being built. And the firm that was uh, doing the pipeline had to withdraw because she faced the loss of all her assets in America, which were considerable. And so Russia has had to convert one of her own boats. And there's only less than 100 miles to be built, but America is determined to stop that pipeline being built. Their argument is it's not needed because there's a perfectly good pipeline that runs from Russia to Europe by the Ukraine, which is hardly used at all. And herein lies the rub. As far as Russia is concerned, she doesn't want to supply gas through Ukraine and pay thousands of dollars to Ukraine in transit rights. She's trying to break the power of Ukraine in order that she can take over Ukraine. And so she's very keen on this pipeline. We shall see whether it ever gets completed. But again, we can see in many ways that uh, the rift between America and Europe will continue to grow. This is what God's word says. This is how the angels are working behind the scenes. And we recall that uh, little passage in Daniel chapter 10, an intriguing passage, which tells us about the Michael and uh, Gabriel uh, having to work so hard to get the king of Persia to go as God intended. Uh, and uh, he had to get assistance and 21 days to, before he would get the king to go in the right direction. And that just gives us a little inkling, brothers and sisters, of how busy the angels are. You see, uh, Johnson was inclined to still cling on to working with the EU, and that wasn't what God wanted. So, right, angels, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to bring this problem, that problem, the other problem, until Johnson changes his mind. So wonderfully, brothers and sisters, we're seeing the hand of God, unseen angels working behind the scenes, bringing about the great changes that God intends. And there's a, another fascinating aspect. We know these words, uh, Luke 21, uh, recorded in all the got three of the Gospels, synoptic Gospels, about the Mount Olivet prophecy, first being fulfilled in the time of AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed, but we know echoing on to our day. Uh, and the picture that was painted was of the political powers, the sun, moon and stars, uh, and the nations of the earth, the sea and the waves roaring. Uh, he uses this phrase that they were with perplexity, distress with perplexity, men's hearts failing them for fear 
and looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now that little word just used by Luke, and this is the only place as a noun it occurs in the New Testament, Vine in his commentary says literally at a loss for a why. And it's a word that's used outside the Bible and it's in the sense of being at one's wit's end, at a loss to know how to proceed without resources. And isn't that the situation in Europe? They're at their wit's end. Compared with the sure-footedness of Britain, they are greatly perplexed as to how they move forward as they face a third wave of COVID overwhelming them. And there's a little phrase that Matthew uses in his account of the Mount Olivet prophecy, is all these things are the beginning of sorrows. And that word for sorrows is the normal word for birth pains. Uh, and we know how birth pains increase in intensity, get more and more frequent and more and more painful as the birth gets closer and closer. So what God is telling us is that what we've just been going through in the last year, it's just the beginning. That's the first pang, as it were. It's going to get worse, brothers and sisters, and going to come more frequently. So for the world, this is going to be a time of great panic. But we know, we see God's hands. We're reassured God is in control. And so I want us to just go to a wonderful passage. We have looked at this in the past in Isaiah chapter 23, which describes the uh, ending of the great power of Tyre, the maritime power of the day in Isaiah's day, how that was going to come to an end. And Isaiah is told that it, although it will come to an end and that came to pass in the time of Alexander the Great, great it wasn't going to totally end. It uses the phrase, its feet shall carry it afar off. Uh, and step by step, the Tyrian Tarshish power has moved westwards until four centuries ago in the time of Elizabeth I, it ended up in Britain's shores. And Britain has since then been the latter day Tarshish power. But then the chapter goes on to say that uh, for 70 years, Tyre is going to be forgotten as the days of one king. And the end of the 70 years, then Tyre is going to revive, going to sing as a harlot, turn to her higher, commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. Uh, and the last verse tells us that it's all for the purpose of being used by the return of Lord Jesus, doesn't tell us there, but reading between the lines, that's what it's all about. And so the revival in Britain uh, is ultimately in going to be channeled to be used to help the return of Lord Jesus establish the kingdom, bring the Jews back from this, where they have been scattered throughout the world. And I believe that we're right at the end of these 70 years. Because talking about 70 years like the years of one king, a 70 year reign is an extremely rare thing. And the queen is one who has now, she is in the 70th year of her reign. She was born in 1926. Because her father was very ill, she and Philip went on a tour of Canada in October 1951. Uh, which was really the beginning of her public service. Uh, later, next year, February, her father died. She became queen. The following year was the coronation, and that was followed by a Commonwealth tour. And the queen has held the Commonwealth in her heart, something very precious, all her life. And so here we are. If we date 70 years from that tour in 51, then in October of this year will be the end of 70 years. If we date it from when she became queen, then it will be February of next year, God willing. And so what I foresee, just as Brother Mike gave us things to look out for, 
for this year, the things for us to look out for is increasing tension between Britain and the EU. And I think we shall find that the trade deal that was agreed will get torn up and Britain will be totally separate from the EU, ploughing her own pathway. So I think we've got until we come to October or maybe February of next year, a lot of tensions. And then Britain will be free to sail away, as it were, uh, and plough that course that the Lord God has for her. But I just want to emphasise, as Brother Mike emphasised, the Lord Jesus can come back at any time. We've got to go to the judgment seat. And so it will be, maybe uh, we will be called away before the ending of the 70 years. The Lord Jesus can come back literally at any time. So we've seen that Britain is being separated from Europe because God has this plan for her, and that is to be uh, like Tyre and maritime power. So let's just look at this aspect. It was just two weeks ago when the long-awaited uh, plan was revealed, Global Britain in a Competitive Age, Integrated Review of Security, Defence, uh, Development and Foreign Policy was the posh title uh, on this uh, manifesto. And the focus was that Britain would be looking not at Europe, but at the Middle East and the Far East, uh, investing a lot of money, 24 billion pounds in defence, and that mainly in the Navy. Her base in Oman is to be tripled in size, and the huge aircraft carrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth, is to go to the Far East, on exercises, linking up with the Commonwealth countries, doing joint exercises and uh, acting as a deterrent to China's aggressive seizing of waterways uh, around China. So this is what this uh, Global Britain is all about. And what Boris had to say when he introduced this report, the overriding purpose of this review is to make the United Kingdom stronger, safer, and more prosperous. The review describes how we will bolster our alliances, strengthen our capabilities, find new ways of reaching solutions, and relearn the art of competing against states with opposing values. We'll be more dynamic abroad and more focused on delivering for our citizens at home. We've always been a limited resource country, so we've been a trading, maritime trading nation. And in 2019, the maritime trade oversees services and goods, 690 billion pounds, a third of Britain's GDP comes from exports, supports millions of jobs. And interestingly, between five and six million Britons Nearly one in ten live in the Gulf and uh, in Asia and Australasia. So a crisis in any of those regions or in the trade routes connecting them will be a crisis for us from the very beginning. So we can see here the drive to be a strong maritime power that can come to the aid of our Commonwealth partners and friends uh, and keep clear the uh, seaways so that trade can flow to Britain. Here's a, a report, the UK to head east of Suez, power projection or search for trade? Well, actually it's both. Um, uh, interesting statements in the middle there, I'll just enlarge it up so we can read it. Uh, the group is a bold statement of intent for a national defence policy that is tilting back toward the Indo-Pacific region after decades of contraction and focus on the NATO responsibilities to the North Atlantic. The deployment marks the Royal Navy's return in force to east of Suez Canal. And 
Britain is a power that has existing bases east of Suez. Uh, she has a base in Bahrain, in Qatar, in Amman, in Cyprus, in Kenya, and on this little island of Diego Garcia in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So with 16 overseas bases, over a third of them are based in this region. Let's just look at a couple of them, the one in Bahrain and the one in Oman. The one in Bahrain is important because on the other side of the Persian Gulf is Iran, and uh, most of the world's oil flows through this Persian Gulf. And Britain's base uh, in Bahrain is the headquarters of what is called the International Maritime Security Construct, which is a grouping of uh, British, Australian, Saudi Arabian, Bahrainian, and UAR, UAE and United States ships, which patrol the area and uh, make sure that the oil tankers can flow freely. And Britain plays the biggest role in doing that. Now, around the corner, as it were, is Oman. And in this Dukma, Port Dukma in Oman, uh, it's a new port. It's nearly complete, but work is still going on. The British and the Americans have um, sections of it. Uh, the Indian Navy also uh, uses it. It's very strategically located because it's away from the Persian Gulf and faces into the Indian Ocean. And it's deep enough and big enough to accommodate both the new uh, British aircraft carriers. Now, part of the plan is to triple the size of the base there. And so uh, just again enlarging up, uh, so 24 million pounds is going to be spent tripling the size of it. And then another 20 or so more million uh, will be spent up to 2028 to reinforce this space that Britain has in Oman. And this uh, investment in Duhma will be viewed by defence analysts as a strong indicator of the UK's intention to stay militarily engaged in the Middle East. And it is from this port here that she plans to protect her interests in the Middle East and the Far East. And so it's quite a remarkable thing that we are witnessing, brothers and sisters, this drive on Britain's part to strengthen her marine forces. Because when we go and have a look at the map of the Commonwealth, now this was uh, a map in in 1898, uh, America became independent in 1776, and she is one of the young lines, the foremost of them. But when one just looks where the bulk of the Commonwealth countries are, they lie east of Suez, this very region that Britain is intent on patrolling and being strong and defending and working with her allies there. We can see the wonderful way the hand of God is pushing Britain a path which the leaders of this country have no knowledge of. But God has mapped out a path for Britain. And whether she likes it or not, that is the path that she will follow in order to further the purpose of God. And so we're seeing uh, trade deals with the Commonwealth realms will strengthen the Western alliance again just this week. And given the rise of hostile actors in the world, now is the time for Britain to shore up relations with Australia, Canada and New Zealand. And we're going to hear a lot more about this partnership between Britain, Australia, Canada and New Zealand. It's got a, a name, Kanzuk, uh, and that's an amalgamation of Canada Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. So put all those initials together, 
and it comes up. This is the mother lion with her young lions, the chief of the young lions. And what is being pushed at the moment is a coming together, uh, a trade pact between these four Commonwealth countries and Britain with the intention of enlarging that out to embrace other Commonwealth countries. Now, you can see from the map how scattered they are, but in today's world, distance doesn't hamper um, relationships. You can work at a distance. And Liz Truss is just about to announce uh, a multi-million pound um, trade deal with Canada, which will greatly enhance the relationships which Britain has with Canada. Uh, and just a little way behind that are new trade deals between Britain and Australia and Britain and New Zealand. Uh, it's just a matter of a, a short time uh, and we shall be seeing these trade deals, God willing, being unfolded. Uh, and this strive for Britain to work with these Commonwealth countries. Uh, and that will be a market which will, uh, though not as populated as the EU, but trade-wise, will be bigger than the EU as a market. EU is shrinking. These are expanding. And it's just come to at the right time. And so, again, brothers and sisters, it's so, re so reassuring to see that this Bible is not an old-fashioned, out-of-date book this is something which is being fulfilled before our eyes. And our historic understanding of Bible prophecy in relation to these things has stood the test of time. It's coming alive just at the right time. Now, America, Israel has just had elections. Um, Netanyahu's party is the strongest, but uh, may not be able to form a coalition. And that's a matter we have to wait and see. But I thought it was interesting that this Times of Israel on Wednesday said, whoever the Prime Minister is of Israel, that the UK-Israel ties will become stronger. Uh, and it, 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 well, it will be a talk on its own. I'm not going to be looking at it. But the ties between Israel and Britain are growing stronger and stronger every day. Is quite remarkable. And Britain, of course, is profiting, um, reaping benefit from the peace accords, the uh, Abraham Accords. And just earlier this week, the UAE signed up a one billion uh, deal to invest in life sciences. They're very interested in the vaccines that Britain can produce and working together. So here's a huge vote of confidence in the UK on the part of the UAE. So let's have a look at the peace dividend. So Mike has been talking about the peace that we know from Scripture, from Ezekiel 38, has to come to the Middle East, and that Britain is going to be on the side of those who favour Israel rather than on the side of those like the EU who are against Israel. So unlike earlier peace treaties, um, we go back uh, 25 years to the Jordan one when uh, Brother Mike was alive, um, and we have to go back 42 years to 1979. Uh, I can well remember that peace treaty being signed, but the problem with both of those is that they were just government to government. They didn't involve the people of Jordan. They didn't involve the people of Egypt. And Mr. Netanyahu realised that in order to boost relationships, you've got to have the people on board. And so he set out upon a plan to change the perceptions of Arab nations in regard to Israel. Now, uh, just how long ago it was, I'm not sure. I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago that some 20 diplomats, both men and women, were sent out undercover 
uh, into Arab nations to work as uh, their cover was that they were business people. Um, but their task was also not only to push trade with Israel, but to foster a new spirit of um, friendship to Israel. Because the Jews, of the, the Arabs I have brought up on a, a diet um, of hostility against Israel, right from the textbooks um, and the media. And Netanyahu saw this as a way of changing things. Uh, and it has succeeded. It is now bearing fruit. And tonight, brothers and sisters, is Passover, about a week ahead of this country, they work on a different calendar. So six o'clock tonight, uh, they will be sitting down to their Passover meals. Now for Jews living in the United uh, Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, keeping of the Passover used to be something which they had to do very quietly and almost secretly, but no longer. They're doing it quite openly. Their neighbours are interested in what is going on, what takes place at the Passover. Kosher restaurants are being opened in Arab countries. Uh, Israeli um, rabbis are, are sending young men to these countries to help the uh, Jewish populations there as they come out of hiding and worship now openly. Uh, the Gulf states are learning Hebrew because they want to be able to converse with their new Arab friends. Uh, their, well, this uh, particular chap is one of the Arab world's most influential TV presenters. And back in December, he said uh, that Arab countries are entitled to normalize their relations with Israel. And as it said, when someone with his weight and stature openly states that it's up to the Arab nations to decide whether they want to make peace with Israel, this sends a message to millions of Arabs that the idea of establishing relations with Israel may not be a bad thing after all. So quite remarkable. And there's this whole change of feeling in the Middle East, this new mood in the Middle East. In fact, the New York Times said it's like falling in love. The Israelis who have gone to Abu Dhabi uh, have been welcomed with open arms. Uh, and those from the UAE who have gone to Israel have likewise been amazed at how friendly the Jews are. <laughs> These people who are supposed to be so evil and horrible are, are so friendly to them. Uh, and it's opened their eyes that uh, they're welcoming because this, these peace deals are involving the people and is driving these Abraham Accords, are driving a great change uh, across the whole of the Middle East. There's talk now of the uh, Arab nations joining up with Israel as a kind of mini NATO to stand up to um, Iran because they can't depend on America being a reliable ally. What a change that is. Uh, unbelievable almost. But again, they're looking to see how they can develop trade between Israel and the Arab nations. And of course, Israel is so perfectly placed on the Mediterranean sea coast to be able to assist them with their plans. Most of the oil of the world gets shipped up through the Suez Canal and we've just seen this past week the chaos when that gets blocked as well as the problems of sabotage and rocket attacks and piracy uh, as one sends boats all the way around Saudi Arabia to get to the Suez Canal and so what is being looked at is joining uh, Israel to these nations, Arab nations, with pipelines. So you don't have to ship to dangerous coasts that can transship across to Israel and then on to shipping onto Europe. And so the United Arab Emirates is wanting to invest $10 billion in Israel. That's just last week. 
um, and the funds are being used to build ports and to build railways. The UAE is eager to develop new trade routes between the Gulf and Europe by Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Israel. And so just a, a bit of detail on that. Uh, two of the big projects that I want to spend their money on is a deep water port in Iraq and a railway which will run from Saudi Arabia across Jordan to Haifa port. And that railway is nearly completed. It only wants 300 kilometres, mainly in Jordan and Saudi Arabia, to complete it. And then the railway will be able to swiftly and cheaply transport agricultural goods and fresh produce from Europe via Israel, Jordan and Saudi Arabia to the Gulf. The plan would also involve greatly enlarging Haifa port. And then down the south of um, Israel, uh, Elat and Aqabah in Jordan, uh, both be enlarged and linked. And then from there, a railway uh, across uh, Israel to Ashdod port. And again, that will, will create a railway link, as well as supplement an existing pipeline that runs from Elat to um, Ashdod uh, carrying oil. And so what they're planning is this railway network, which is almost all completed, but just completing it so that the countries of the Middle East are linked to uh, the port of Haifa in Israel so that trains can take stuff uh, from the Mediterranean and distribute them without having to go through the Mediterranean and facing all the piracy uh, that happens now. And as well as that, what they are looking to is to, as it were, duplicate that network with oil pipelines. 50 years ago, that's what was built, huge pipelines, which took the um, oil from Saudi and uh, these places across to um, Israel and to the ports on the sea coast there. But they've fallen into disuse. But the pressure is um, not using tankers to transport, but to use pipelines. So we see uh, an interesting, fascinating future as this vast wealth of the uh, Arabs gets poured into making life easier for them, uh, but bringing great wealth to Israel and making Israel the pivot point of the Middle East. As Brother Mike has pointed out, it is inducing in Israel a spirit of pride which will be so greatly humbled when all that is broken, when Russia thinks her evil thoughts and turns from being a peacemaker to being the chief enemy that leads the armies against Israel. But that lies in the future. We're seeing the preparation that God is making. And Israel is now shipping produce from Israel into Saudi Arabia and into the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and that's opening up great markets. And so, as we see, this is a warm peace. They want to deal uh, with Israel. The whole uh, spirit of the area has changed. Uh, and they need what Israel has to offer, the desalination, the irrigation, farming techniques to enable them to feed their peoples in this very desert barren area. And they need Israel, they need technology to uh, replace their dependence on oil. They've got to find alternative sources and they can see that Israel will be the one that can help them on that. And of course, they need Israel's defense. This is the most important aspect against Iran, against Turkey. And in a post-COVID world, they need the tourism so many Israelis are keen to go and visit. And just as these countries are very keen to go and see for themselves what Israel is all about and learn the truth of how Israel is not an apartheid state at all, but Jews and Arabs live peaceably and prosperously side by side in Israel. And if the Palestinians chose, they too could prosper. And this prospect of being a hub for the oil. And of course, now they can fly over each other's territories. This is when 
flying gets back to normal, if that does take place, then that will be a great saving in time to get into destinations. And so great uh, business. Well, that, this, that statement has been overtaken with $10 billion now going to be invested in Israel. But it also interestingly opens the markets. You see, until now, countries have had to choose whether they will deal with Arabs and upset the Israelis or deal with Israel and upset the Arabs. That's no longer the case. Arabs aren't going to be upset if you deal with Israel. Israel's not going to be upset if you deal with Arabs because they're working together. And so we can see that the events that have been taking place are absolutely stupendous. They're fulfilling Bible prophecy. Things that seemed impossible are now becoming possible and almost a reality. And so, brothers and sisters, we come to the end of this talk. And we've seen how that various pressures, COVID, Brexit, Middle East peace, anarchy movements, EU integrating and being driven closer together, and the UK seeking world ties, all these are different elements which are in God's hands. Angels behind the scenes working out God's purpose in order to bring about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and as we said before, we say again, the Lord Jesus Christ can come at any time. We have to stand before the judge. And during that period of judgment and a period of great changes in the Middle East, then all the final pieces of the jigsaw will drop into place. And so, as the brother Mike said, he stole my strap line. We will not be able to say to the master, you didn't warn us you were coming. He has given us abundant signs. He is at the door, brothers and sisters. And the whole purpose of these talks, as brother Mike stressed, is to make us watchful, to be alert, because it's so easy to be in that Laodicean state, to be asleep and not be listening to these things. And sadly, many of our ecclesias are not interested in, in what is going on in the world around them. They have fallen asleep. Let us not be in that position. Let's hold fast to those things that remain. We know the word of God is true from the beginning, and the falsehoods of man will not shake us in our determination to hold fast to these things which are true. And so, brothers and sisters, my traditional last slide, we've talked about uh, milestones. Um, four times a year, the Bible magazine comes out, and I have a section in there. In fact, it just earlier this week, on very early hours of Wednesday morning, uh, I sent out the next instalment for the next issue. So you can keep up to date, up to date with the, um, what's happening in the world with the Bible magazine. And if you really want to keep very up to date, these get sent out every day, every two days. The snippets are what I use in building up these talks. All the items which are of interest and they are increasing in number um, are sent out and all linked together. So if you want to receive the snippets, then just send an email to me at Don at Milestones UK. Dot org. And so, brothers and sisters, thank you for a wonderful day that we've been able to spend together. We live in most amazing times, and may our Lord soon come. Until he comes, let's remain strong and faithful, upholding the word of God and bringing glory to the great creator of the heavens and earth. Thank you. Mm -hmm.